Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, we are now here live at the Prince of Investment, coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful city and state of Honolulu, Hawaii, via Denver, Colorado. Ladies and gentlemen, guess what? It's a new year. This is the first episode of 2022. I'm honored and glad to be on for a few years now. So starting this year off, we have a, a lot of crazy things going on in the market. We're still in the middle of a pandemic, something that came out in March of 2020 that we're kind of shocked that we're still dealing with in March of 20. Well, coming up on March of 2022, two years later. Also, we have inflation. The latest CPI report came out 7% inflation. But here's the whopper. We have unemployment. The last unemployment report that came out last month, unemployment has dropped down to 3.9%. So in, unemployment is dropping. We have inflation going up. We have uh, we're in the middle of midterms is coming up. So we're wondering, hey, where is where are we going in this whole market thing? We see technology stocks take a big drawback. Last year, well, in 2020, technology stocks was a darling. We've seen, um, we've seen things like cryptocurrencies take a major drawback in 2022, leaving most people, most investors, standing on the sidelines or people that are in the game wondering, what's next? What's ready for 2022? So you know I had to bring on my great guest, Uncle James. He's here live all the way from New Jersey slash New York, that I like to call it. He, um, he's a de uh, definitely a friend and a contributor to the show that I'd love to have on, um, that I'd love to reach out to for mentorship and guidance. And last year, he told us about the stock called BPT. So we're going to look at that BPT. What's coming up? Is it oil? Is it tech stocks? Is it consumer staples? Is it financial stocks? What's going on? What are our stock positions? predictions for 2022 without further ado let me bring on my guest mr james Fortland. how you doing today sir how are you it is so i am so glad <laughs> to be back um and and unfortunately lately this is about as close to hawaii as i could possibly get these zoom calls i i feel warmer when i zoom into like we do a zoom call into hawaii it's hawaii. Awesome. <laughs> nice. nice i love it it's awesome um, okay. So you said the magic word. Now I know mm -hmm. we got a short show here, so we got to step it up. Though mm -hmm. that big word is inflation, and I mm -hmm. believe that last year I like not maybe not early in the year, but later on in the year I was screaming about inflation. Um, people were not listening. I'm old enough to have lived through the 70s. I could see this thing coming. Uh, this is such a rerun of the 1970s. I feel like I'm watching an old TV show. Um, probably starting like in about 1972 when we went off the, I, th I think 72 or 74 when Nixon pulled us off the gold standard and then all, all the crazy things we did in the 60s uh, started to catch up to us in the 70s and inflation like ran wild for the whole decade. Um, it's nice to see that the Federal Reserve and some government officials have finally embraced the idea because for they were in like the denial mode for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really silly, but at least they're facing up to it a little bit. And now, unfortunately for the Fed, they have to pay play some really major catch up. So that brings us once again to our to our stock picks. And what are we looking at? Well, in some ways, it's really similar to last year. Once again, I'm going to tell you. Oil will outperform crypto in 2022. Oil will probably outperform almost everything except for maybe copper. Um, the big weakness for us with, with oil was the stocks yeah. underperformed. Yeah, the nice stocks. Jimmy dropped there very, that's, yeah. you was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty on there. So there yeah, we go. The, okay. You was pretty, that was pretty bold. Stocks pretty bold underperformed the commodity. Uh, but this year, I think you're starting to see some catch up. If you, you reminded me of BPT, probably somewhere in the middle of the year, it hit a nice, got up to about 642 or 649. Then it kind of went flat the last quarter of the year, along with a lot of oil stocks. Um, well, tech kind of was bouncing up and down. Um, tech, I think, already started to correct in the last quarter. It's just those big, giant tech stocks that we are that like the four horsemen and all that stuff. They seem to pull everybody along. But a lot of the smaller companies were already having some issues, you know, you, as you could see, at least from a stock price. Um, I would say this is what I'm looking at this year. I'm looking at I agree with Goldman Sachs. We are in a commodity super cycle. And commodities led by oil and then many other commodities such as copper and perhaps lithium and things like that are booming. 
and they're going to continue to boom. Um, there is no way all this alternative energy can make up the, the energy gap that we see right now. Uh, oil inventories are probably about 5% below the moving at the five year moving average uh, and we're 2% oil total oil uh, output is 2% under the demand right now global demand, which is an enormous gap. Um, to give you an example, if you wanted to build solar panels to make up uh, make up enough power, you would have to have the whole entire state of Arizona filled with solar panels to have enough power to say power a small state like New Jersey. So we just don't have the room, like the technology is just not there yet. Um, on the periphery, I think it works good. I think the biggest problem we face is again, we're into this, if you're for fossil fuels, you're against alternative energy. No. I'm for energy choice. I think there's a lot of options and I'm certainly not against the, trying to destroy the planet. That's like absurd. But I also wanna be warm at night and when it gets to be like about 20 degrees in New York City, we need to turn those thermostats up a little bit. Anyway, I'm bullish on oil. And then um, the commodity story actually is really interesting. It's more than inflation all this alternative energy, all these electric vehicles, the demand for commodities is going up because of these, these, these alternative, I, I call it alternative energy because I'm old, because I'm from the seventies, but the, the uh, EVs and all this other stuff that you see, all this battery powered vehicles, you need a lot of commodities for those batteries. Mm. So some people are saying, Goldman said that copper is going to be the new oil in 2022. In other words, it's going to go to the moon. Um, and I had brief, I might have mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned it last year in the beginning of the year, there's a stock called Val, V-A-L, I think it's the symbol, or it might be V-A-L-E. Uh, it's, a, it's a big mining company. Mm -hmm. um, uh, commodities are a hard thing to play because mining companies are notoriously uh, sketchy, let's just say. Um, and the big thing for your audience, because you have a lot of new investors in your audience, is that commodity stocks are very cyclical. So unlike a growth stock, which is growing like crazy and trades normally at a very high PE to reward uh, that growth rate, um, so what you do is when you look at a growth stock, you go, wow, the PE is really low. That makes it a buy. Well, with cyclical stocks, it's totally the opposite. Because, for example, if you mine for copper, your fixed costs maybe are climbing a little bit, but they're pretty steady over a long period of time. But the copper price is going up and down depending on demand, depending on new technology, depending on a whole bunch of stuff. So when you look at cyclicals, and I kind of made this mistake early with, with Val, I bought in a little high because the PE was like down to three. And the stock, the stock kind of had a rough quarter at the end of the year, the PE has expanded a little bit and a higher, what you do with cyclical stocks is you buy when the PE is high and you sell when the PE is low. It's like totally the opposite of what you do with a growth stock. Mm. And I, James, and I want, James, I want to say something. Oh, um, I was looking at my uh, notes and you were right. When you looked at Bitcoin price, January 1st of last year to where it ended the year, January or December 31st, and you look at BPT price at the beginning of last year to the December 31st, BPT oil outperformed cryptocurrencies. It's, uh, <laughs> it's going, I mean, that thing is going to the moon. And I know there's a lot of detractors out there, but let's face it. Well, let me, I, I can ask you this question. Why are you so bullish on oil? Um, cause I did this, we did this in the seventies. We try to do all this alternative energy and it, it, it really can't replace what we need unless we're going to greatly lower our standard of living. And despite the fantasy that a lot of politicians have that think we're going to lower our standard of living, we're not going to do that. And you're seeing it now. I mean, that's part of the reason you're seeing all this remote work. I mean, COVID has speeded up changes that were long overdue in our society. And so because of COVID, you have more remote work. Because of remote work, you have more migration in the country. People are fleeing high tax states or what, what they call the blue states, and they're moving to all the red states. And, it's, and not only that, the companies now are following the people. 
So for example, Oracle moved their headquarters to Texas. Elon Musk has been very vocal about moving things to Texas. Um, who, there's a bunch of other companies. Uh, oh, Facebook just opened a big office in Austin, Texas. Surprise, surprise. Um, and if you go uh, to other states like Miami, Miami is becoming a huge crypto hub. And many people think that Miami may become the new Wall Street, that many of the big Wall Street firms are talking about moving down there. Because right. there's no Cause income. Because of the taxes up in New York? No, yeah, there's no income tax. So, I mean, for me, or for a guy like you, it makes a big difference. Imagine if you're making, why do you think a good basketball player plays in Miami? Because there's no income tax. So if you get $20 million a year or $50 million a year or $100 million a year, if you're paying, if you're not paying, that's a big savings. That's not a little savings. That's a huge savings. So uh, I, and, and I think people are fleeing. Uh, they're looking for more opportunity or more freedom, less restrictions and lower taxes. And so they're going to all these red states. I, you know, and I'm not talking politics. I'm just talking tax policy and just money. Um, and I think now the power is shifting. I think a lot of stuff is pulling out of New York and out of like the Northeast. And it's gonna it's gonna be domiciled in Texas. It's gonna be domiciled in Florida. It's gonna be domiciled in Alabama. It's gonna be domi. I mean, I have a city from Arkansas that sends me their emails trying to coax me to move down there. And I'm like, I've never even heard of it. And I was like, wow, that looks like a really nice place. I would, that might be a nice place to live. And, um, you know, so, so there's a lot of that going on. And when you have this sort of great disengagement, like everybody's kind of, you know, quitting their jobs or changing their careers because COVID, COVID impacted them in, in some way and they're trying to get a better handle on this. So they're like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something else. Um, and then on top of that, with all this remote work, it's like, I could live in Florida, like you were doing it right now. I'm in New Jersey, you're in Colorado, and we're on a TV station in Hawaii. How cool is that? <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and neither of us are technological geniuses, yet we're, yet we're all doing this. And, and, like, and, like the, and like the engineer is explaining everything really cool and, like, it, and it's working. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, so that's, that's the beginning. I think um, – I brought I brought a whole bunch of yellow pads, so I I, I like with shopping to okay. buy more yellow pads. That's how excited Jay, I was. Hold, Jay, hold on to that yellow pad because I want to take a quick break right here. Sure. Uh, we're going to go into our uh, break here in the show, then we're going to come back, and I want to talk to you about that inflation run that you uh, spoke about. Inflation just hit seven percent. So I'm going to think about during the break how. Or do you think inflation is going to go? Because we know the Federal Reserve is going to come in. They're going to slow up the, they're going to taper back their asset purchasing. They're going to raise interest rates. But will they be able to, how far inflation is going to run before the uh, Federal Reserve is, can be able to stop it? So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a quick break. I mean, a very quick break. And we're going to be right here, right back on the Prince of Investment, right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. I'm Dan Leaf. I go by Fig because I was an Air Force fighter pilot for 33 years, and you have to have a nickname. I get to host on Think Tech Hawaii two shows, Figments, The Power of Imagination, and Figments on Reality. The Power of Imagination introduces you to some of my incredible friends and their life experiences, astronauts, war heroes, Hollywood writers, you name it, they're on it, and you'll be inspired and entertained. And on reality, I'll give you something hard to find non-political commentary on today's events. That's right, non-political, because the vitriol doesn't help folks. So figments, the power of imagination, figments on reality, both on Think Tech Hawaii. Two major crises have descended upon humanity, climate change and the coronavirus. They may seem independent of each other. In fact, they are very closely linked. The emergence of COVID-19 on top of climate change is a spiraling crisis, and it's just the beginning. Twenty twenty two stock predictions started a new year. First short of the year, top of the year. Crazy prediction that Mr. James Foreland made last year about oil and cryptocurrencies that came out to be right. But we want to get back into this inflation, that 7% before the break. 
Inflation, CPI report came out yesterday, consumer price index, inflation at 7%. We know the Federal Reserve is going to step in. They're going to taper back the bond purchasing, asset purchasing program, and they're probably going to raise interest rates. But will this slow down inflation? James, how far do you think inflation is going to get before the Federal Reserve can slow it down? Because I've seen inflation was at about 13% in about 80, 81. So um, you think we're going to get up into double-digit inflation? Probably. I, I would say unless there's a major change in Washington, I think we're going to we're going to this is this four years is going to get away from us really badly. And I think and inflation is like a weird thing. It kind of builds up like and then it kind of creeps up on you. All of a sudden, you'll start to notice more and more crazy things like the houses you were looking at for two hundred thousand dollars a year ago are now three hundred thousand. And like the year you'll you'll just. You start to feel it it permeates everything and when the fed has to play catch up like this they're going to be raising i mean you're looking at like maybe for them to really get going they're going to have to jack interest rates up probably twice a month all like for the whole year and that won't even that won't even get them even they're just like they'll barely be caught up i i just i think they let the cat way out of the bag here and this is this is you know catacruz catastrophic really coming all right, now, James, I want to ask you this question. Why are you so big on what does copper, you, you explained about oil, why does copper and these other commodities, why are they set to what's going on? History is repeating well, itself. Yeah. I wasn't here in the 70s and the early yeah. 80s, so let me know. Well, this is where you had gold like jump to the ceiling and all the all the crazy gold bugs got really rich and sat around waving their fingers and everybody going, I told you so. I told you so. The world is coming to an end. It ended yesterday. You know, they're going to mm -hmm. I don't think the world's coming to an end. I don't think the tech sector is finished. I think the tech sector is correcting. Um, and I think that the commodities are going to go up because historically, uh, like hard assets increase in value in an inflationary environment. In other words, if today I have $100 and I can buy $100 worth of groceries and three weeks from now that $100 buy $75 worth of groceries, if I have a fixed asset like copper, gold, silver, titanium, uh, lithium, something like that, those the value of that stays the same, yet it takes more and more dollars to keep buying them. On top of that, now you have all these EVs. So Tesla needs tons of lithium for those batteries. Um, all these, everything for everything in, in with technology uses tons of copper, lithium, all these like uh, metals. And hmm. I just I think between the two, the inflation push on the price. And the demand push on the other side, it's um, it, it's it's a recipe for, as Goldman called it, like a, a, a cyclical commodity boom. I, I just think we're going into one of those big booms like the 70s, where gold okay. just went up and up and up, and then it flattened out around, I don't know, 80, 82. What do you think? So what sector, what stock, or what companies you think are going to get creamed, meaning going down, it's going to go into a bearish state and why? I, I think you're going to have a lot of issues with, with, I think tech is into a big correction now. And this is not to say that I don't think a lot of these companies are going to make tons of money. Um, I don't see really how inflation is going to really impact companies like Google and Microsoft, because a lot of them are making money off selling your data and managing your data. And data is not gonna go away. If anything, there's gonna be more of it and it still needs to be managed or, or somebody needs to spy on you and steal your information so they can sell you stuff. And so there's a lot of that. I, I, don't, I, I think that, uh, but what's happening now is because tech went up like crazy and I hear this all day long on Wall Street, all the Wall Street shows, interest rates go up, it's gonna hurt the tech industry. So it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy at the moment. Um, but over time, some companies are going to start to, ex uh, you know, they're going to start to stand out and they're going to reverse this trend. Um, probably a lot of the big tech stocks that did really well the last couple of years are going to resurface and do well again. And then there's certain areas like, you know, stuff like remote work. Uh, again, I, I'm going to hawk 3D printing, which I've been hawking since like, 1995 yeah. <laughs> and I've, mm -hmm. I've never made any money with it but i continue to think it's the next big thing um and so i think i think there's there anything involving remote anything uh and anything that facilitates remote anything i think is a home run i i think in the in the short now, run let me, let me ask you this question what do you think about the travel industry 
I, th I think it's going to be a tough go. I, I think a lot of these companies have kind of sold their soul to the devil. They have, cr they have dug their, dug their own graves. Um, they have done stupid things. Um, the travel industry of anything should be looking, to, should be promoting a more open society because open societies travel more, mm -hmm. not focus on how many restrictions we can throw on travelers and all this kind of stuff under this idea that somehow you're safe. If anybody thinks they're not breathing a lot of germs when they fly a plane, um, I, they need to, they need to reassess their, they need to do a little reading because, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like taking the subway and thinking you're not going to get any germs because you have some little mask on. It's, it's, it's packed with people. It's not clean. It's like, and same with a, with a, with an airplane, you're in recycled air, you're packed in like a bunch of sardines. It's, 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 it, it is what it is. Um, I think at this point in the game with COVID, we have, we have what? at least 50% of all adults have been vaccinated. The, about 45% of the rest of us have either gotten COVID or like, so we have some kind of natural immunities. Um, I just think right now they're, they're milking this thing. I, 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 and not to say that it's not serious. If you're a high risk, if you're in a high risk group, it's high risk, just like the flu is, just like a cold is. If you're high risk, it's high risk. Don't don't take. If you're in any of those high risk groups, you need to take this really seriously. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of healthier people and young people, yeah, wash your hands, be careful. But you, you're you're for, like especially this Omicron. Pretty much all the data says it's basically like getting a cold, and mm -hmm. you know, like a light cold. So to close down whole businesses and stuff over Omicron is kind of silly. It, it just, I, I think you're, we did it this already. It didn't really work. We need to find a new strategy. And I think the travel industry is kind of, to some degree, instead of promoting openness, they've kind of encouraged this, you know, all our pilots have to be vaccinated. Everybody who works for the airline has to be vaccinated. All the passengers are going to be, have to be vaccinated. And not only that, now we, now I'm starting to hear, like, we have people say, well, the vaccine's not enough. You've got to get at least one booster. And maybe you're going to have to have two boosters. Now, let me ask you this question. What do you think of the um, financial industry? Well, finance is going through a big change again, just like when the Internet started. I, I think this, this blockchain is a direct threat to traditional finance. Um, I think the problem is with blockchain is blockchain needs a, a buttonwood tree moment. They need a buttonwood agreement. Um, they need some kind of regulatory framework to work within so the big boys will feel more comfortable uh, and there's enough liquidity for really big guys to trade. Right now you hear about some of the big guys, but in essence, the whole entire crypto market is like what, not even, it's not even as big as the gold market, it's tiny. And even, but it gets 90% of the press, but it, mm -hmm. it it's really small. The other problem with the, with, the, with the whole finance market and with blockchain and all that is, there's no big like blockchain promoters out there going, this is how we're going to help grandma do this. This is how we're going to make your life easier for you. I can remember like, I don't know if it was Jim Clark or somebody when Netscape went public, they were like, even an idiot like you can go on the internet now. And I was like, and they were all right. You didn't, you didn't even have to know how to read to use a Netscape browser. That's how easy it was. That was an awesome technology. And that's why everybody got on the internet. The Let blockchain- me ask you even with the rise, you know, the Fed is going to kind of come out and run up behind interest rates. And, you know, they're talking about raising interest rates about three times this year. Um, you don't think the banking industry would benefit from that? I the, the Not the raises later on, because you'll reestablish the yield, yield curve. That's what you need. You need rates to go much higher than they should be, because then when the Fed, for example, if interest rates are... 20% and the Fed cuts them down by to 15%, that's a huge boost to the economy. But when interest rates are, are 1% and the Fed cuts it to three quarters of a percent, that doesn't do anything. That really does. That's just like the gravy. It, it, it loses its, it's a Fed tool that's disappeared. So the Fed needs to tighten up the money supply, uh, stop printing money, buy up all the clean up its balance sheet um, and start ratcheting up rates. I would say maybe like twice a month, they need to jack up rates like crazy. And I know when I say that people are going to have a nervous breakdown. Well, my it, thing is I'm trying to see who will benefit from rising interest rates. Well, once rates are up to a certain level back to the historic mean, then banks now have reestablished the spread. 
So they can borrow money at 5% and lend it out at 20%. They can do that again. Right now it's kind of all flat. So it doesn't really, it's not really working right. That's one thing. The second thing is in the long run, I think a lot of this blockchain. Wait, well, James, but if, like you said, by interest rates going up, that's going to increase the spreads for the banks, which I 100% agree. Um, the Fed comes out, let's say, I think the next meeting is sometime next month. They come out and say, hey, we're going to take interest rates up to 1% and then go to 2% then 3%. We might end the year up at, I don't know, 4% or something like that. I and sure hope so. I'm looking wouldn't for that. Yeah. Wouldn't that take banks from having that flat spread to like opening it up some more to making them more profitable to be able it, to borrow? Would, the other thing is, is if more people put cash in banks that paid interest, it, it's a cheap, it's cheap access to capital. Now, mm -hmm. mind you, the money center banks, they can't depend on that, but smaller banks, um, and we talked about small banks a long time ago. I remember one time over the phone for a while. Um, smaller banks need that, they need those local depositors because that's cheap money for them to lend out to, you know, they can, you leave money in your savings account and you get 2% interest and they give it to somebody else who has a credit card with them and they charge them 20% interest. The spread's huge. Mm -hmm. But when you don't have, we know there's no reason for anybody to put money in a bank right now. Um, what are they trying to do? They're trying to sell you insurance. They're trying to make it up in fees. There's like a fee for everything. <laughs> and, and, and all they do is piss off all their customers. And then you have blockchain coming along and creating all these like, banks for the unbankable, non-bank banks, all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff where you have like one card and like you can, you don't even need a bank anymore. You can transfer money on and off that card. You can do all kinds of things. You can even have your 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 paycheck deposited on that card. And uh, there's there's just a lot of stuff like that. And I, I think that's, um, that's probably banking at its most elemental form. That's what banking is all about, really. It's, 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 it's growing capital, community capital, so that money can be redeployed in that community for, you know, businesses, house, home loans, things like that. And that, that's kind of what we've been missing, because now all these banks just borrow money from the Fed, and then they loan, they do crazy stuff like buy CDOs with the money so they can get these huge returns. And then, and, and then we're the only time we hear from a bank is every 10 years or so we're asked to bail them all out again. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So now what about, uh, you know, I went back and I read uh, Berkshire's, you know, Warren Buffett's shareholders letter, letter back in the eighties, I think it was 81, 82. Um, when the last time we had inflation, that was in the double digits and, um, Mark now very smart. he was, he was talking about, you know, invested into companies that are, uh, what, what did he say? He said, invested into companies who can raise their prices very easily they can in have an inflationary environment, AKA yeah. like a Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola can raise their price by 10 cents. Maybe, I don't, I, don't, I don't know anymore. Like in the 80s, they probably could. See, I think Microsoft could raise their prices. Google could raise their prices. A lot of these tech companies that uh, supply uh, technology that you can use for social media that businesses use. Like I use this thing called Hootsuite and they just came out and they said, for the first time in 10 years, we're gonna raise our prices. And like, and I use uh, MailChimp and MailChimp has raised their prices and so, uh, so there's going to be some trade-off. A lot of people are going to go, well, that's too expensive. I'm going to look for an alternative. Um, but there's some stuff like that there just isn't going to be an alternative. So people are going to, you know, there's certain software that you just, you, if you want security software, you got to pay for it. And uh, some of those companies like have that, they have that pricing power. I just, I think it's there. I'm not sure Coca-Cola does any more. They might've had it at one time. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure anymore because that soda market now is so changed. Mm -hmm. Same with beer. We used to say like Anheuser Busch could get away, you know, get away with anything, but maybe not anymore. Maybe yeah. yes. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I like I'm not so sure consumer products are that thing anymore. Mm -hmm. I think I think many of these consumer products that we all that we all kind of know have done a lot to damage their reputation in the last couple of years. So I'm not really sure they're the go to okay. things anymore. So James, um, we got to get it rolling. We got to get out of here. What do you want to leave with the audience? Um, I want the audience to, you know, just embrace the dynamic of the market. It's, 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 you got to, when you invest, you're looking to make money. 
and you're looking to manage your risk and make money. So don't don't be like just because you buy an oil stock doesn't mean you don't want to drive an electric car. Like don't there's it's not one or the other. It's a combination of everything creating, um, you know, cre really creating a better environment for everybody. But it has to work together. That's number one. And number two, I would say don't give up on tech, even though it's correct going to correct maybe maybe well in through the first quarter. Don't don't give keep eyeballing those stocks you like because they may get real cheap and they may be i don't know i wouldn't say a fireside sale but a lot of them are going to trade down in prices and there might be some sort of generational opportunities coming up here to buy some really good quality tech stock names that in, the, in two years from now they're going to go well they had pricing power just like we said on the show and even though we didn't think so at the time because we were all buying coca-cola because we thought coca-cola had pricing power um and i and i think for a lot of people it's it's like a good you know don't 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 look like right in front of your nose look the, you got to look out to the future and okay. well well james um definitely how can people follow you how can people get more of you uh how can they find you on your tours out there in wall street i don't know how you're all right well COVID. i wanted to Tell mention everybody. this tonight is that um i i'm taking a little hiatus from tours because i was pulled out of retirement to work on an investment banking deal um i've done a little crowdfunding and i'm working on a project on we funder called mm -hmm. the king of Kong. we're actually selling a tv show and the difference between WeFunder, say, and, and GoFundMe is that WeFunder, you actually sell equity in the project. So people, a small investor can get mm. a piece, can get some ownership. So we, we, I set up the site, we filed with the SEC, we did all kinds of crazy stuff and, and it's kind of a nifty fun thing. Um, and it's got me, it's got me pretty busy for the next couple of months. I'm going to be working on it like crazy. And that's kind of the thing. You can, of course, find me on my Facebook page, Unofficial Wall Street. That's still there. I'm going to keep updating it all the time. Um, and generally, if you send me a question or say hello on there, I'm, I'm usually pretty friendly most of the time. And then uh, and if you send me an email, if I don't answer it right away, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's just probably because the way Facebook works, I didn't even know I got the email because that for some reason, I'm, they're really slow with the notifications from that particular page. I don't I don't know what I did wrong when I set it up, but I must have done something wrong so that's me all right well ladies and gentlemen boys and girls and children of all ages uh james we definitely appreciate you for having you on you know you're going to be back on definitely appreciate your uh insight that we're going to play back and ladies and gentlemen to the next video podcast cartoon book or car whatever you see me do crazy around the globe my name is prince dykes i'm the prince of investment peace be safe i'm out and thank you